Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I'm Naila Shudra and these are the headlines. Four U.S. soldiers have reportedly been killed in a roadside mine explosion in the northeastern Syria. Syria's state news agency said the slain soldiers were taken to U.S. base in the Shaddadi area. It said following the explosion, the U.S. forces cordoned off the area. In Russia, three people have been killed in a shooting at Baltimore military airfield near the southwestern city of Voronze. Russia's state media said the soldier opened fire on his colleagues with a handgun, which he took from an officer. Azerbaijan says the Armenian troops have again targeted civilians with various small arms and mortars. The defense ministry says Azri's military retaliation dealt heavy damage to Armenian troops in the Khojavend region. It says the operations in the Akhbir, Akdam, Khojavend and Gobaldi fronts continue varying with intensity. Mexico's COVID-19 death toll has crossed 95,000 with infections tally nearing 1 million. In the United States, the caseload is approaching 10 million, while its fatality count has topped 237,000. Pakistan has reported over 1,600 new cases and nine fatalities overnight, with the death toll reaching 6,977. Globally, the virus has claimed over 1.2 million lives and infected more than 50 million people. And in football, Valencia thrash Real Madrid 4-1 in a Spanish La Liga fixture. Carlos Soler's hat-trick over penalties secured Valencia's win in the extraordinary match. The latest win moves Valencia to the ninth place in the league with 11 points. For news and details, stay tuned. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. In northeastern Syria, four U.S. soldiers have reportedly been killed in a roadside IED blast in the Haska province. Syrian state media says the slain troops were taken to a U.S. base in the Shaddadi area. It said American forces cordoned off the area after the explosion tore through a U.S. military vehicle. It said U.S. forces in Syria and their Kurdish allies control much of the area, including major oil fields. The U.S. has around 100 troops and six Bradley fighting vehicles deployed in the region. It ramped up its military presence back in September after skirmishes with the Russian army. Earlier, three civilians were killed and nine others injured in a landmine explosion in the Hama province. In Russia, three people have been killed in a shooting at Baltimore military airfield near the southwestern city of Voronze. Russia's state media said the soldier opened fire on his colleagues with a handgun, which he took from an officer. It said the soldier has now barricaded himself on the territory of a military unit. The motive behind the shooting remains unclear. The Baltimore military airfield is a part of the Air Force Academy, which has been under reparation for over seven years. In the United States, Joe Biden's advisors have begun discussing who can fill in key posts after he pledged the most diverse cabinet in history. In his first speech as the president-elect, Biden vowed to unify the country. Biden and his running mate Kamala Harris have launched a transition website, Build Back Better, and a Twitter feed. They have listed the tackling of COVID-19, racial inequality, and climate change as top priority. His defeated rival Donald Trump continues to cast doubt on elected results. His campaign has mounted legal challenges to the results in several states without offering any evidence. China has reasserted its positions on bilateral relations with the United States. Foreign Ministry spokesperson says China is always in favor of strengthening communication and dialogue with the United States. 
In a news briefing, Wang Weibin said the two countries should work out their differences on the basis of mutual respect. The spokesman added both sides should expand cooperation across the board on the basis of mutual benefit. On the United States presidential election, Wang said China understands the results will be announced in adherence to the laws. He noted Beijing will respond in accordance with the international common practice. Irish Foreign Minister Simon Coveney says Joe Biden's election victory may impact Brexit deal trade talks. Coveney said Biden's remarks in support of Ireland can weigh on crucial ongoing negotiations. Coveney called Biden a real friend of Ireland. He said Biden during his campaign made a very clear statement on the Irish border issue. He said President Donald Trump and Prime Minister Boris Johnson had a close relation and there was much talk about a trade deal. Coveney asserted that after Biden's election, number 10 will need to be paused to ensure Irish issues are prioritized. Earlier, London said it had assured the next U.S. government that it will not put a risk at the 1989 peace agreement for Northern Ireland. Iran says Donald Trump's ouster from the White House is an opportunity to rebuild relations in the Middle East. In a tweet, Foreign Minister Javad Zarif said relying on outsiders for regional security was not wise. The Iranian top diplomat said geographic realities can't be altered with the removal of officials. Zarif extended an olive branch to his neighbors and called for cooperation in achieving common interests. Earlier, Tehran said the Trump administration's harmful foreign policy can serve as a lesson to the new White House leaders. Iran's presidential head Mahmoud Vazai said the next U.S. government should rethink its wrong policies. At least 11 people have been killed and eight others wounded in an attack on a military post in Iraq's capital city of Baghdad. Police say the attackers used grenades and automatic weapons. They said that the assailants in four vehicles attacked the post in the city's al radwania district. Police added security forces have started a search operation in the area. Earlier, Iraq's Joint Operation Command and U.S.-led coalition launched a major offensive attack against ISIS in the Saladin province. In a statement, the JOC said security forces seized militants' advanced weaponry. Azerbaijan says the Armenian troops have again targeted civilians with various small arms and mortars. The defense ministry says Azri's military retaliation dealt heavy damage to Armenian troops in the Khojavand region. It says the operations in the Akhdir, Akhdam, Khojavand and Gobaldi fronts continue varying intensity. The ministry says the enemy was forced to retreat in some areas of the front. The latest fighting erupted a day after Azerbaijan said it liberated the city of Shusha from Armenia after 28 years. The city is considered as a strategic fortress and a key to control over the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Over 1,200 people have been killed in nearly six weeks of fighting in and around the Nagorno-Karabakh. In Belarus, thousands of protesters have taken to the street in the Belarusian capital city of Minsk. Over 300 people have been reportedly detained in the capital. The protesters are calling for President Alexander Lukashenko to resign after 26 years in power. The initial gathering in the center of the capital was dispersed by security services. But protesters later split across the city with scattered groups staging small demonstrations. The country has been rocked by mass protests since a controversial presidential election in August. Major powers, including the United States and the EU, have imposed sanctions against a string of Belarusian officials. Thousands of people rallied in the Georgian capital, Tbilisi, against the results of the parliamentary elections. Dozens were injured as police used water cannon to disperse the protesters. The protesters held a peaceful rally at the Shotar Vostolvi Avenue in the parliament during the day. The police said it used water cannon after demonstrators tried to storm the Central Election Commission building. The Interior Ministry said the police used force because protesters did not obey the instructions. Opposition leaders called on supporters to leave the scene, announcing to hold more protests today. In the October 31st general elections, the ruling Georgian Dream Party emerged as the winner, prompting the opposition to protest.
In Argentina, thousands of pro people are protesting in the capital city of Buenos Aires against the government and the president, Alberto Fernandez. They were protesting the ailing state of the economy, pandemic lockdown measures, and proposed judicial reforms. Demonstrations brought the traffic to a standstill in the South American country's capital. Argentina's economy contracted by a record 19.1 percent in the second quarter, while analysts predict a 12 percent plunge in 2020. In Bolivia, Luis Arce has been sworn is and as the country's president. The ceremony inaugurating Arce was held in the city of La Paz with several leaders in attendance. Heads of state from Argentina, Paraguay, Colombia, Spain and senior officials from Chile, Iran and Venezuela were present at the ceremony. The newly sworn in president has pledged to defeat the pandemic and heal the political rift in the country. Arce says the former president Evo Morales will play no role in his government. We assume this mandate given to us by the population, the people, to work tirelessly and with humility for the reconstruction of our country. We commit ourselves to rectify what was wrong and to deepen what was right. It's now time for a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Mexico's death toll from COVID-19 has crossed 95,000 with infections nearing 1 million. The United States is set to become the first country to hit the 10 million infection mark. India's capital city of New Delhi has hit a peak of the third wave of the infections. The country reported 490 deaths overnight, with the toll crossing 126,000, whereas the total number of infections has crossed 8.5 million. Iran has reported its deadliest day yet, with 459 fatalities, pushing the toll over 38,000. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 1.25 million lives and infected over 50 million people. Pakistan has registered nine COVID-19 deaths in the last 24 hours, pushing the tally to nearly 7,000. The health ministry says 1,650 people tested positive for the virus overnight. The ministry said nearly 345,000 cases so far, almost 319,000 patients have recovered. It added there are nearly 19,000 active cases in the country, while 972 remain critical. As the country's witnessed second wave of the virus, the National Command and Operations Center has imposed fresh curbs on gatherings. The NCOC has issued straight gatherings, guidelines for venues, timelines, and sitting arrangements on events. The Sikh community are all around the world are celebrating the first anniversary of the inauguration of the Kartarpur Corridor in Pakistan. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan inaugurated the corridor to facilitate millions of Sikh pilgrims from India and around the world. Darbar Sahib Kartarpur is located in Narwal district of Pakistan, which is the last resting place of Sikh spiritual leader Guru Nanak Dev. The opening of the corridor last year took place on the eve of 550th birth anniversary of Guru Nanak. The Kartarpur corridor has been widely recognized as a new symbol of peace by the world community. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres acknowledged the opening of the corridor as a practical proof of Pakistan's desire for peace and interfaith harmony. To mark the anniversary, Pakistan's Sikh Gurdwara Parbantha Committee and Evacuate Trust Property Board are organizing a function at Kartarpur. On the other hand, home to the majority of Sikh, India has been attempting to malign the step taken in good faith by Pakistan. The corridor was closed amid the pandemic, but Pakistan announced to reopen it on the 3rd of October, while the Indian government has remained undecided. There has been outrage among the Sikh community in India over the issue. They said New Delhi has reopened all places of worship, then why not open the corridor? Pakistanis all over the world are celebrating the 143rd birth anniversary of the country's national poet, Allama Muhammad Iqbal. Across the country, various social and literary organizations are organizing seminars and exhibitions to honor Allama Iqbal's birthday. 
In his message, Pakistan's President Arif Alvi underscored the need for following Iqbal's teachings on Islam and his philosophy of self-realization. Prime Minister Imran Khan said Iqbal is a great mystic with a pure spirit and his thoughts continue to inspire and guide us. Born on the 9th of November 1877 in the northeastern Salkot city, Iqbal conceived the conception of a separate homeland for Muslims. In his famous address in Allahabad, India, Iqbal said Muslims are a distinct nation and deserve independence. Iqbal produced literary works in Persian and Urdu languages. Of his 12,000 verses of poetry, about 7,000 verses are in Persian. His tremendous work in both languages earned him the title of the Poet of the East by literary critics. Myanmar's ruling National League for Democracy Party has proclaimed victory in the general elections. Official vote counting is underway after yesterday's general polls and the election commission is due to release early results today. 315 seats are up for grab in the 425-member lower house, while 161 in a 217-seat upper chamber. Aung San Suu Kyi's party claims that it has won 322 seats in the parliament to form a government. Talking to media, NLD's spokesperson thanked people and said it was an encouraging election result. Supporters of the party gathered in the biggest city, Yangon, to celebrate what they called Suu Kyi's win. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed says Tigray People's Liberation Front has been preparing for war with the federal government since 2018. In a televised address, Ahmed said Tigray's People's Liberation Front siphoned development funds to buy weapons and train militias. He said the TPLF's aim was to make Ethiopia ungovernable by instigating clashes along ethnic and religious lines. The Prime Minister said the party conducted both covert and overt attempts to undermine Ethiopia's administration administration and people. A key challenge we faced in this regard from the early days was the organized and highly networked obstruction of justice that was being orchestrated by those who played a leading role in the systemic abuse of human rights and massive corruption. Meanwhile, Abe has replaced his army chief, the head of intelligence, and the foreign minister as the military offensive continued in Tigray. French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves de Durain has asserted his country's profound respect for Islam during a visit to Cairo. The French official is in Egypt to ease tensions over France's defense over the publication of blasphemous caricatures. Jean-Yves de Durain held talks with President Abdul Fateh al-Sisi and Foreign Minister Sameh Shoukri. He also met Ahmed al tayeb and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar's Egypt's highest Muslim authority. In a press conference, de Durain said Paris is fighting for the freedom of belief. In a statement, al tayeb reiterated that blasphemous caricatures are completely unacceptable. Drain's visit also included discussion on Egypt's conflict with western neighbor Libya. He said France and Egypt were on the same page in demanding the immediate withdrawal of foreign mercenaries from Libya. Spain's Canary Islands has noted a sharp increase in the number of migrants from West Africa. The government has recorded over 11,000 arrivals in the island this year, compared with about 2,500 in 2019. Spanish emergency services said over 1,600 migrants have been rescued or reached the, the islands of the Canary over the weekend. Talking to the media, Canary Services spokesperson said the migrants have arrived about 20 barely seaworthy boats. The spokesperson added that the migrants have also been arriving on the islands of Gran Canaria, and Turvenif, and El Hero. She said the rescuers recovered a body of a migrant who died during the unsafe journey. 
Storm Eta has made landfall in Florida with maximum sustained winds of 100 kilometers per hour. The National Hurricane Center has warned the tropical storm could strengthen into a hurricane near the Gulf of Mexico. Florida Power and Light says more than 37,000 households are currently without power. Earlier, the storm pounded central Cuba with torrential rains, bursting the banks of rivers and causing flash flooding. Thousands of people were evacuated ahead of Etta's landfall. State media says the storm knocked down trees and caused power outages. The outer bands of Etta also caused a landslide in Jamaica's capital city of Kingston, isolating residents. The death toll from the calamitous storm in Central America has crossed 150. Thousands of rare photos of space exploration are up for auction at the Christie's in London. A rare photograph of astronaut Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon is a part of the comprehensive collection. The Voyage to Another World collection curated over decades is a mix of iconic images that were unreleased at the time by NASA. The auction house says the sale of over 2,400 photographs documents the Apollo missions and the golden age of space exploration. So this is an incredibly exciting collection of photographs and we are honored at Christie's to have been entrusted with the sale. It's 700 lots, over 2,400 photographs in total, documenting the artistic heritage of the Apollo missions and the golden age of space exploration. The sales top lot is an unreleased photograph of Neil Armstrong, taken in 1969, when he became the first human to step on the moon. The photograph is expected to go for $39,000. Another image due to go under the hammer is of Armstrong's crewmate, Buzz Aldrin, when he managed to photograph himself during the 1965 space mission. It's, it's the first selfie in space. Uh, we're so used to selfies these days as being easy and done by everyone, but uh, this is a big camera that uh, Buzz Aldrin had to, to turn around and uh, point at himself with a beautiful image of the Earth in the background. Other items range from early images of the far side of the moon from the late 50s to the NASA and Apollo missions of the 1960s and 70s, and ending with images of the Red Planet. Christie's online auction will run till the 20th of November. The 2020 MTV Europe Music Awards are here. K-pop band BTS won big at the virtual ceremony while Lady Gaga was voted Best Artist. True for this year's MTV Europe Music Awards. Even during a pandemic, show organizers found a way to gather music lovers and creators. It's locations around Europe. Among the performers was Alicia Keys, who sang Love Looks Better, partly in a face covering. <laughs> South Korean boy band BTS was once again the big winner this year, going home with prizes for the best song and best group. Carol G won the best new Latin act category and the best collaboration for Tusa, featuring Nicki Minaj, who was named Best Hip Hop Act, Coldplay won the Best Rock category, and Hayley Williams won the award for Best Alternative Act, while Lady Gaga took the Best Artist Award and DJ Khaled was awarded the Best Video. European stocks are trading higher as markets around the world make gains following Joe Biden's victory in the United States election. The pan-European stock 600 climbed 1.5 percent with travel and leisure stocks adding nearly 3 percent to the lead gains. Frankfurt's DAX advanced 1.7 percent while London's FTSE gained well over 1 percent. Over in Paris, CAC fluctuated around 1.5 percent. Italy's FTSE MB MIB gained close to 2 percent. Earlier stocks in Asia-Pacific also rallied with Japan's Nikkei 225, leading in regional gains. In football, Valencia thrashed Real Madrid 4-1 in a Spanish La Liga fixture. Carlos Soler's hat-trick over penalties secured Valencia's win in the extraordinary match. 
Karim Benizima put Real Madrid in the driving seat, scoring from a long range. But Solar's equalizer came soon with a penalty. Real's centre-back Rafael Varane's own goal capitalized on Valencia's lead, followed by Solar scoring his second form, another penalty. Valencia's midfielder completed his hat-trick with the third spot kick awarded when Sergio Ramos handled. The latest win moves Valencia to the ninth place in the league with 11 points. In the other La Liga fixtures, Real Sociedad beat Granada 2-0, whereas Real downed Gratif 3-1. For the latest news updates, you can follow us on our social media at Indus.News.